Good evening. Good evening. Uh, tonight's lecture, uh, lecturer is going to be Joana Gonçalves, and she's going to speak on the environmental performance of tall buildings. Just a few words about Joana. Joana is an architect. She was born in Rio de Janeiro, where she studied architecture. Uh, and she worked uh, for several years with uh, Ana Maria Nimaya before she joined BAA to do the MA, uh, the Master Course on Environment and Energy Studies here at BAA. Uh, she, she then did uh, her PhD in the USP, the Universidade de São Paulo in Brazil. <laughs> and uh, she also uh, has taught uh, in USP since uh, 1998. Uh, and she has been environmental consultant on projects around Brazil, uh, which among them included the new research center of Petrobras in 2005. And she won a, num a number of awards uh, on design competitions. Since 2009, she has been here uh, uh, within our academic staff uh, to the Sustainable and Environmental Design a Master Course uh, at EAA. Uh, before proceeding, uh, I wanted to say a few words. So we will have a short introduction by Klaus Border. Klaus Border uh, is a found the founder of uh, BDSP Partnership, and he al he is also uh, um, he also is within the set staff. Um, today's lecture is uh, connected to the launch of Joanna's book, where we can uh, see the, the cover, The Environment Performance of Tall Buildings, uh, which is going to be launched today, to, uh, and there will be some drinks later after this, uh, this lecture, downstairs, uh, together with the AA Bookshop. You can purchase the book today with a special price, and so we hope we enjoy the talk and that you enjoy afterwards for the drinks and for the book. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, um, thank you, Paula, for a uh, brief introduction to me. Um, I think a number of you might know me because I've been here for a number of years at EAA. And uh, probably only a few of you know that uh, my relationship with Joanna is purely business. <laughs> okay. um, <coughs> um, I'm not here <coughs> talking. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the book because um, for those of you who don't know, Joanna, um, even before she did the book, she did a PhD on uh, environmental performance of tall buildings. And at the time, uh, I was also assisting her in uh, this particular subject. And uh, I was, was very surprised how interested she was in the subject, only to realize afterwards maybe I had something to do with it. Um, that she might have been interested in me more than in the subject. <laughs> <coughs> but those of, you who are, those of you who are not men quickly realize how stupid men are. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think I should shift away from personal matters to business matters. In terms of um, environmental performance of tall buildings, um, why I find this particular subject uh, interesting is, and probably why we have a full house, is um, because there is a lot of rhetoric about this, and the, the tall building is often cited as a good representation of sustainable design, in the sense of, you know, you uh, maximize uh, a lot of density or densification, whichever way you want to define it, into a localized area, close to transportation uh, nodes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <coughs> now, 
equally, there is a big debate in terms of can you actually equate high-rise with sustainable design? Are these complementary or are they diametrically opposed? Um, something that would really help bring this discussion a bit closer together is the issue of having hard facts in our hands that speak for themselves. In there lies the conundrum because we absolutely are working in a vacuum in terms of public knowledge vacuum, in terms of how well high or tall buildings or high-rise buildings perform. In fact, people are afraid of releasing negative information or negative feedback. The reality is negative feedback is positive feedback if we want to learn and move forward in a, um, in my view, positive manner. So, <coughs> performance is one of the key words of the book, <coughs> and in that context, I believe, is a key indicator. In that manner, what actually the book will go through, I don't know how many of you have actually read the book. Can I just have a raise of hands? How many have read the book? <coughs> We've got one. Excellent. <coughs> so, but for most of you, you will see that this particular word or this theme is a recurrent theme that runs through the book, and it has a lot of merit because it opens a lot of debate and question. So, one of the first things that also is addressed is usually for those of us who are in the practicing world or have practiced before, realize that by the time we finish practical completion, we move on to the next thing, and we rarely ever find out how good our buildings perform. We like to hear accolades. We don't like to hear about problems. But the reality is there's one issue, which is also dear to me, is this subject that's rearing its head more and more these days in the current climate is post-occupancy evaluation. And maybe there's an issue here whereby we as professionals should in some shape or form be contractually bound to be attached to what we produce for at least a certain period of time beyond practical completion. Um, it becomes an interesting liability and legal subject, but I think we are responsible for what we deliver, but obviously we deliver as a team, and in comes the next element. The second point is occupant behavior and interaction of the occupant or behavioral modeling and performance of buildings is fundamental, and in there lies the next conundrum. How do you actually assess that, identify that, and uh, evaluate that. Um, the other s particular points I want to drag out is the subject whereby I mentioned earlier about lack of feedback or of information. Um, Joanna can probably sing many a swan song about what she had to get up to to get even some basic information out of some of the offices around the world were extremely protective about uh, the, the information. Um, but at the same time, she has successfully managed to get good feedback that does show that tall buildings can be environmentally high performing. I don't want to go into the subject of whether they are sustainable, but certainly they can be environmentally performing. And the Comets Bank, she'll talk probably about that, I presume, is a testament to that. It is interesting as a building, I'm, I may have got my arithmetic wrong, but it's probably um, over 10, 10 plus years, between 10 and 15 years, finished, established. <coughs> and I would challenge every, anyone to sort of prove through performance if there's any tall building built since that has surpassed the performance of that building. I don't think they have. So we have learned more, we've moved forward, but somehow we're not delivering the same product. Which raises the question of, one, to achieve that, it isn't just in the realms of the architect or the engineer, it is in the realms of the user, coupled with the client, coupled with the art. It is a holistic aspect, which is a true part of sustainability. The second element, what it also does, in the sense is that it opens up a whole discussion 
about what is environmental quality, what is value. It isn't, in my view, the classical definition of real estate in terms of net to gross or grade one or whichever way you want to define it, because these, you will quickly find out with time, is an oversimplified, inadequate, dated, and major obstacle to the development and propagation of environmental quality in commercial developments. I shall substantiate that by some particular examples. Um, even the project 30 St. Mary X, by the same architects, Foster and Partners as Commerce Bank, a building that came later, was actually sold more than three times its construction value. Now, those who actually do know something about facts is the environmental performance of the Commerce Bank is superior, but it underlines something. And it underlines something in the sense that there is a value attached to environmental design. This value, or call it attached environmental design, which you may define as environmental quality, and there's many definitions of that in the book or challenges in the book, is interesting in the sense that in, if you look at nowadays investors, what do you think one of the key parameters is that interests them? Is it maximum net to gross or is it risk management? In actual fact, issues about uncertainties of future trends and the buildings we help to design and put up have a minimum lifespan, in my view, of 25 years plus, easily 50 years. So go and ask an agent what's going to be like in 50 or 25 years, and he will look at you with big eyes and has no answer. The issue is we've got to design for that. We shouldn't design for today. And in that context, this is where issues come in which will define the value. So, for example, how do you address risk in the sense of taxation liabilities of the future? Carbon taxation will happen. And, in fact, there is something in the book and the foreword that was raised, which we called, uh, I believe it's called a carbon exposure index. And what is interesting is already happening in the States um, through the Obama administration because of limited amount of capital that flies around, is that if you're seeking capital funding, they're starting to look at not only at the asset, but the value of the asset over a certain period of time, and in that context, carbon. That means energy. So, it is without a shadow of doubt that adding value through environmental quality is something that we'll be faced with, and designing just to be compliant to building regs is something that I believe is from the past, in the sense that by the time you have finished your building and it's built, you're already out of touch with the way the market has changed. Um, I could go on and... Uh, talk about all these economics aspects which sound <coughs> terribly boring, but I'll be frank with you, selling an environmental concept through energy saving or money saved by energy doesn't wash. Energy is too cheap still today. It might work in the future and I've certainly learned it through hard experience. We have to sell these in a very different manner to our clients we have to talk about hard economic facts. And they listen, and they are also prepared to change. <clears throat> I would just like to close at this point, because those of you who know me, I can talk and talk and talk, so I'll quickly finish. Um, <clears throat> and what I like to do is, I just would like to thank Joanna for um, having table something which I think some people might find a bit controversial. Um, I actually believe it's excellent that this issue comes out. Uh, it raises debate <coughs> and hopefully very soon we'll see a sequel to this in the sense that we might get more factual data and then the facts should speak for themselves. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. 
Thanks, Klaus, for the relaxing introduction. <laughs> I think if, if, if I was tense, I was tense, I'm tenser. <laughs> and if you guys were a bit rigid now, you definitely relax, which was the objective. Um, before anything else, I would really like to thank EarthScan, I know they are here, for believing in this book. Um, especially after the peer review we got from the book proposal, which was very, very challenging. I could see already in the book proposal how I was upsetting some people. Um, and many questions were raised, and the funny one was, well, there are two that I would like to share with you. One was, what do I know about tall buildings to think I can write a book about that? And the answer was, well, we are talking about environmental design and the fact that I'm not directly involved with the politics of the design actually gives me a distance to be able to make a, a true factual criticism um, completely based on, as we said, facts, and which lead to opinion, opinionated, yes, um, based on, on what I've seen around the world on that. Uh, and the other interesting question was, the Commerce Bank appears as a, almost a benchmark for the topic. And this building has been designed 15 years ago. It's, it opened in 1998. I mean, it's such an old building. You think 10 years, it's such an old project. There's so many more new things to see. Why are you looking down to the past, back to the past? Well, exactly because of that, because it's something which is there for 10 years and, and has, um, without any special like for the topic or for the building, has a, a definitely incredible performance that we're gonna see some of this tonight. Um, and then Earth, EarthScan took the challenge and it was great, it was a great thing to do. Until the last minute, a month before the issue in June, we were still working on the text and working on the graphs it was a very dynamic process. Um, the book is not a manual about environmental design. It's not a SIBSI guide um, it <laughs> for the engineers. And it's also, like I said, it's not a manual for specialists on environmental design. It's from the perspective of an architect speaking to architects. It's, it's totally very easily uh, understandable, even when we, when we talk about data and figures. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. I really, the challenge was to fill a gap in the literature where we have coffee table books, hundreds of them. Look how beautiful is my tall building. One nicer than the, nicer than the, the previous one. One taller than the previous one. But very little discussion about it. And then on the other hand, we have some urbanists and very hardcore academics and, and political architects that says this is a beast from the capitalism. There's nothing we can learn from them. They can be good, whatever you do, which is also the other extreme. So let's bring facts, let's build a discussion, reflect on environmental design, and put something that uh, can show a different perspective. It's not pro-tall buildings, it's not anti-tall buildings, it's let's understand the problem bringing principles of environmental design. So it's definitely um, a, a motive, or mainly a motive to discuss environmental design methods, principles, and value. So that's why I was able to do it. Um, the, the book has two forwards. It was meant to have three. We have two forwards, one from an architect who is a strategic planner, John Worthington. He's the W of DGW. Uh, he's very passionate about architecture and sustainability. And, and brought to the book, to the introduction of the book, this issue of, of what we have from the legacy and how the tall buildings started you know, before Le Corbusier, of course, but he brings the mark, Le Corbusier as a landmark, as a watershed, uh, and how how many beliefs about the, this typology can contribute to urban sustainability bringing density, opening green areas, but actually the building itself was not thought through environmentally. And in the end of the day, even urbanistically, we know what kind of problems 
that thinking um, has. Um, so you see the front doors, the meeting points, the public space was all undermined by our modernist ideologies, uh, which are very well represented by the tower and the cluster of towers. And then when we look at today, as opposed to that dull environment, you know, we have cities trying to use this typology to actually intensify its urban qualities, its urban life. And it's, it's bringing the tallness or the tall building not so much uh, and not only as a density factor, but also as an as a innovative, as a, a changing, transforming factor. Uh, more than, than building high, yeah, but bring intensity to the city. Still, some, quite a lot of design challenges remain. Be built incrementally, adapted through time, and truly environmentally responsive. There's much more of a consensus about how the tall building can, be, can contribute to the urban sustainability uh, as opposed to what it can actually really do as, a, as an architectural typology. So in the introduction, we ask first why, you know, and, and <laughs> this question coming in the end, the book was almost done, why should we consider the environmental performance and urban sustainability of tall buildings? Why this is important today? Well, we have an urban scenario. This is Sao Paulo, for those who don't know. Um, we have an urban context. Sao Paulo is, is, is an example of many other cities in emerging economies, which after 100 years of urbanization has ended up with parts like that. This is actually, you can look around and almost the entire city is built on taller buildings, um, more and more, uh, which are left to be retrofitted, which are having a certain impact on the, on the ground and also on, on the energy, uh, in the building sector and the quality of life. We can't ignore that. We just simply cannot ignore that. That reason alone, this scenario alone, which is in front of us, it's already a reason for, f for looking at that. And then on the architectural perspective, we have forces of globalization defining district centers around the world with little or non consideration on environmental performance, on environmental impact, and also urban. And there's something we can do about that. We saw today in one of the Mark's presentations how we can be corrective with an environmental design and how we can also be generative with environmental design. But we can definitely improve that. So this is a reality that needs to be tackled and needs to be faced directly. So after why then, but what that we are talking about, what is it? Um, and I must make a parenthesis now and say, the book comes from the PhD work, it's a reinterpretation of the PhD work, and, and through the PhD, you know, it was incredible um, experience of meeting so many architects, engineers, developers, city planners, from Chicago to Sao Paulo to talk about it. And one of the common ideas about what is a tall building, talking to these people who are involved in the field for a long time, is that it's something relative. Um, in urbanistic terms, it's much more important what's the height difference between neighboring buildings than how tall it is, in fact. Uh, and in architectural terms, there's slenderness, you know, uh, the relationship between the base and the height that will also impact the structure design, for example. So what is a tall building? The first question I got back as an answer from structure engineers is, but where? Where? Where is this question applied to? Are you talking about Hong Kong, London, Sao Paulo? Um, and even if you want to be technical, you look at building systems, the definition can always change. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter how tall it is but what is the relations with the urban and within the architectural brief. Then what is a sustainable tall building? Um, it's, of course, it's something that involves planning, urban design, engineering, architecture, and the occupants. Anything can only be called sustainable once it's built in operation in life after a certain time. So we need lifetime we need time to say that. 
Um, how do we achieve more environmentally responsive tall buildings? Well, that's a question that the book addresses throughout its chapters. Uh, and we started with principles. It's definitely not a black box. We can open it. And we have to go into serious rigorous, rigorous design procedures that are also available. We have the science, we have the techniques, we have the principles. Um, but something that we need to do, it's not about technologies, definitely changing values. Um, the values that created the Seagram building, need, they definitely need to change. This era is over. It's also over the era of sustainable blah, blah, blah. So give me an unusual shape, put me an interesting facade and say sustainable is not enough. Uh, and, and the secret lies in changing our values, the change of values. I mean, this from the central core to the most naive idea that everything can be controlled environmentally. It can't. And if you try, you're going to fail. Um, we, we know that by fact today. So trying to correct this is only going to give you a very small margin of better performance. And we have examples. I mean, we are not talking about something possible or never done or unusual. If we look in 1920s, 1930s, you know, the Mackey building in Rio uh, was mainly conceived by Le Corbusier with a team of Brazilian architects. Change it already. It's, it's before the Seagram building. It's the same time of that ideology, but it really shows different values. The core, the facade, the shape, the form, the urban insertion, completely different. And then we have the, the HSBC is something that is, is a, a major milestone and a, and a watershed in the history of tall buildings, although it was never too tall in its context, which is very interesting. But it's, the, it's definitely the, the precursor, the, the beginner of applying concepts for environmental design. And then almost 10 years later, the Commerce Bank took the challenge, the design of the Commerce Bank, the challenge put forward by the HSBC took fall, uh, further and apart from the daylight, natural ventilation was introduced and successfully introduced. I'm going to go a bit quicker. What is, what is a good performance and how do we assess it? This is key. And I can tell you now, give you the gold. I mean, it's not by looking kilowatt hours per square meter annual only. Definitely not. You do that, you're going to have some of very good buildings maybe but it's much more than this. Um, we're going to talk about the indicators soon. How much better than the conventional one? How much better than the conventional one? This is something we still don't know. We have to push the agenda forward. But like I said, the Commerce Bank and other buildings, uh, very few are putting the targets. And we can be much better than 20% less, less or 40% less. I mean, we can be seriously 60, 70, 80% less, significantly less. We can do much better than what we are doing. And practice has proved that. But we have something we have to deal with in the search for performance, which is this pressure for the aesthetically iconic building versus the lack of data leading to unproved environmental claims. This is going very fast. Everything goes very fast in this field. Um, and although we are in the era of the phenomenal, spectacular tower, which is associated with the environmental tower, it, can, it should not overrule performance. So we need to start opening the Excel spreadsheets. Um, and we have a few examples here that I would like to, to put it as a, as a challenge. The environmental claim to our buildings, which leads to false paradigms. You know, we have three different types of approach. Isolated architectural features. I mean, what a blind can do in a deep plan tower in terms of environmental performance. Marginal improvements, almost nothing. In a building like the, the New York Times, the loads, internal loads, heating loads, cooling loads, are definitely much more influenced by the internal gains, the occupation, than what happens in the facade. Of course, there's going to be some impact, but 5%? maybe, just because the form is not there. It's not just about the facade, although the facade is what you see. So it is a gesture. Uh, it improves the quality of what is in the perimeter of the facade, but if the deep form 
remains, if the central core remains, we're going to be working within the limits of the conventional performance still. Or we have the Bank Boston in Sao Paulo, which is a glass tower, transparent glass, double glazed tower in the tropics without the shading. They actually added the shading afterwards, internal roll-ons, uh, white curtains, because the people could just stand, they couldn't work. Um, and this is the first eco building. So here we have a, a gesture, the first one. The second one, we have a misconception. And this is the worst thing that can happen. And this is what um, famous practices do often, unfortunately, in emerging economies. You know, we have a critical mass there. You shouldn't just do the quickest. Um, and then the third, I mean, of course, it's a generalization. It's not always like that. But the third problem that we also find is just uh, some technical um, appliances or, or systems. You put a few PVs, you put fuel cells, which is an innovation for buildings, um, and you have a green label, you have a green tall building. Definitely not. And this is the, the most naive approach that we can have. You know, we have to tackle the core, which is the design. So for me, speaking very truly, very openly, these are false examples of what it is. Of course, Hanzo Piano is a fantastic architect. Nobody's questioning his ability. But the New York Times, I mean, it's, it's a very conventional, limited building. And then, OK, let's go now through some nice images. I'm going to give you an overview of what is inside. It's not a technical lecture. Uh, we start with the tall building and the city. So like I said, it's using the tall building as an objective, as a, as a motif to reflect about environmental design and the city. Um, and when we look at uh, the tall building and the city, the most critical point we architects know is how these things touch the ground and what do they happen with the space around it? What do they make with the space around it? They need space, actually. So density is a challenge. They need space from each other so we can have light, ventilation, views, and even appreciate it if it's an icon. Um, it defines the urban form. It impacts the ground conditions. And within the ground conditions, because we are doing an environmental um, criticism or, or critical review, urban microclimate, it's, it's a challenge and has huge impacts. It can change completely the natural climate, the local climate. And the design challenges for the urban insertion there is where, how many, how far from each other, how high. We don't have a specific answers for these questions, but they are addressed through looking at the cities, observing spaces around buildings, talking to planners, and looking at the science. We have a science for urban microclimate, for example, which can give us many answers. Um, and that's what I try to, or I put in the chapter, give you, giving clues and tools on how to approach these questions. Density, diversity, and infrastructure are always all together. You know, New York is a successful example of that. It's probably one of the most urban efficient uh, areas that we can find in, um, busy cities um, because of the proximity and the density created by the tall buildings. Although there is a research PhD from Cambridge who proved the same density could be achieved with perimeter blocks of seven story high. But it's not the same environment and it's not the same life. It's not the same urban space. It's just the same density. Density alone, it means very little. It just is a number for urban engineers to work with, with systems, infrastructure, nothing more than this. And, and Curitiba in Brazil is, I'm sure that most of you know, it's an example of an eco city, especially because of its, um, the way the city has been managed socially as well, not just environmentally, but has a plan for verticalization, which is all along the main uh, transportation axis, very carefully thought, thought through. Urban form, it's uh, probably something that attracts us the most, especially architects, 
and politicians and mayors, you know, what form my city will have. So top buildings are geographical and economic landmarks. You know, you look at the, you see the Commerce Bank, you know what the financial district or the banking district of Europe is. You look at New York, it's a city of towers. It's still a landmark, but as a cluster. When we have a more, much more controlled policy, like in Frankfurt, which is uh, totally unusual. There are no other city in the world like Frankfurt where the mayor tells you or the city tells you where to put the tower and how tall it can be and even the form that they would like the building to have. So it's com totally controlled. It's a totally different case from, from New York. But still, uh, the, the, the building is used for landmark. When we look at the urban quality of the ground conditions, this is key. This is Marina Towers in Chicago. And this was the thinking and until very recently, and in most cases still today. Whatever happens on the ground doesn't matter. I arrive, I come from my car, I park, I go up the tower. I have no connection, interest with the city. Um, and there are ways of going around that and improve that. But it's not done like this because there's no other way. It's done like this because this is the belief, this is the idea. I mean, I don't care what is around me or under me. Um, and then we see again, we can bring the Commerce Bank, which is almost a, a nouveau, noble entrance of a theater, incredibly well done. And or you have the, the Mackey building in Rio again, where the building totally permeable. You can just walk through the site in the Commerce Bank, you can as well. It's just a different climate, so it's more closed. But you know, with principles of urban design, we can do much better. Uh, and it affects the climate, as we said, tremendously. So basically, the, the environment created between buildings is determined by these buildings. On the left-hand side, we have uh, a street of New York that until 30s, 40s, it was designed with concern with solar access to the ground floor, but very arbitrary rules. And we can just see that obviously it didn't solve the problem. Um, and, and on the other hand side, we have uh, Rio de Janeiro, Copacabana, where the first street behind the sea is five degrees hotter, warmer than the front because it's just blocking the wind. So a total complete disconsideration of urban climate and this will reflect in the quality of the city, in the value of the buildings, in the social structure of the city. It goes far, it definitely goes far. Uh, and there are real initiatives to deal with this problem, the impact of the building in the urban. The city of Frankfurt does the simple solar diagrams just to see the impact of the buildings in the, in the sky, in the sky view factors, in the, in the shading of public spaces, very easy to be considered. Or just simple concerns, you know, like or in Rotterdam, the taller buildings will be one, one block away from the main road because we want to preserve the views and preserve the structure. Um, and, but we need new variables. We are not talking about the basic coefficients of urban design to control the impact of tall buildings. We need to look at solar envelopes. We need to look at airflow around buildings. We need to look at sky view factors. It's not the conventional urbanism or urban rules that will come up with anything good that we need, either in the cold climate or in the hot climate. The good news, though, is that taller and tall buildings in warm cities, in, in tropical cities, can actually, whatever you do, since you don't do compact, you will help your climate. It will create the shading, it will bring the air turbulence. It's actually something that improves the quality, the uh, microclimate of the city. Chapter two, okay, I'm gonna be a bit faster. Chapter two looks at global perspective. So we look at Europe, um, North America, South America, and Asia. We take cities to represent these uh, parts of the world. Uh, and Frankfurt in, in London, it has a long history on the design of tall buildings, very controlled, Frankfurt much more than in London, but still uh, the architects who deal with these buildings or are dealing with them in the city know how many reports they have to do about that. And it's been very regulated, but it's still negotiable. 
which is something special about Europe. You know, the rules are there, but if you prove you have a better performance or you are bringing something else, you can negotiate the design. And then we have New York, which is becoming a flat roof, not really flat, but the economic forces drive the heights completely. Um, and therefore, it's a totally different city and an urban form. But it is changing. Uh, they are much more concerned about the energy performance, although I don't think it's strict enough. When we look at South America, we, cop we copy the cheapest American model. Uh, that's what we do. And very soon we're not going to even be designing facades. For the moment we still do the facades and the uh, European and American offices do the design that they have more or less ready. Um, but we really have to push harder for better quality of the design. Very little concern about the ground and no interpretation of the climate, or very little. It can continue like that. So I have a strong point here. Um, especially because we come from a place we are, they are being done somewhere where we dictated history before. And, and legacy is very valuable and needs to be reinterpreted for the new tall buildings. When we look at Asia, Far East and Middle East, we have a mixture of things. We have the ecological tall buildings from Kinyang, which some are being built. A few have shown some good performance. We don't know about the rest. And we also have Abu Dhabi and Dubai, which is a challenge. I mean, simply, to cut the story short about this scenario, things are going too fast to be able to be controlled or thought through or examined properly. The performance of the fabric of the buildings have improved since 2005, 2006, once KPF and Foster and other offices have gone into properly. But still, we have a long way to go, and they sit on the petrol, you know, that's the problem. So energy is extremely cheap and awareness is very little. But people that says that this is the American model is wrong. It's a totally different building. It's a much bigger building with five, six times more energy consumption because of the climate. It's only the same in the postcard. That's all. Um, but and, and when we look at the challenge that we have ahead, the International Panel for Climate Change would like us to have some kind of energy savings around 60% by 2050, maybe even more. And without, you can read the book, but without revealing what some of the icons say, but we have iconic buildings that claim to do 40%, 30% better than the conventional practices in their context. It's just too little. If this is an average, we have to go above it to be able to hit it, and it's simply not there. So iconic tall buildings in different parts of the world are not achieving the target, with a very few exceptions. Chapter three, it's the design chapter. Towards an environmental approach, we talk about environmental design, we talk about what is comfort, which are the main strategies to reduce the energy consumption, how do you how do you think a facade in a building like that? Is natural ventilation possible? It's definitely not a mystery. It's definitely possible, and it's working in many cases. How to do it? What's the role of the facade? What's the role of the urban form? What's the role of the occupant in making natural ventilation happen? Key messages, sorry for the writing, but I think this was so important. It's the role of adaptive opportunities. The users need to be put in place. There are rules of thumbs to design, to environmental design, even of tall buildings, but they are not predetermined architecture solutions. They are just rules of thumbs, very basic. Natural ventilation, it's possible, and it's becoming gradually more acceptable, definitely within the European context. For, for you guys to have an idea, something that we found out studying the Commerce Bank, um, less than two years ago, almost 10 years after it's uh, launch operation and successful image around the world. The buildings around, which are newer than the Commerce Bank and were built with sealed facades, are changing their facades because they want to look like the Commerce Bank. So it's an incredible impact. We, one would never thought about that. So it's, it's, that's how far or how easily we can influence or a good design can influence. They are just changing their facades which are newer <laughs> just to open the windows. The problem is natural ventilation is not just opening a window. 
what is behind the window, what is the form, what's the material, what is the use. And some of these buildings were not thought to work like that. So I, I wonder, I doubt how successful they will be, but we can definitely see a change of culture there. Avoid the idea of energy efficient facades and consider energy efficient buildings. There isn't the energy efficient facade, the smart facade, or the good system, the efficient system. It is the building, the form, and everything that comes to it. Comprehensive assessment, you know, we need qualitative and quantitative indicators. Just the pure simple kilowatt hours per square meter is, is very simple. And then, uh, which are the environmental design requirements we need? Uh, we have, and this was a very interesting discussion in the process of the book. I had a few conversations in the, some other academic forums. And one of them was with a philosopher who said, environmental design is dictatorial. What are you trying to do? I said, oops, is it really? I don't think so. Dictatorial, why? Well, there are so many rules and you have to fit within those rules. And when we look at these buildings and how buildings are being occupied, you actually think it's much, gives you much more freedom than the modernist tall building, which you have a fixed desk, a set environment, a homogeneous facade, no flexibility, no tolerance for nothing. The environmental design will give you quality and conditions especially if it goes into the contemporary view of environmental design that counts a lot on the occupant, that you adapt yourself. It's definitely freedom. It's not dictatorial. And with principles and facts, we can prove that. And we see how different you can be. Of course, we have to scrutinize each of these buildings. But in principle, they have aspects that work and other aspects that can be challenged. Like the central core in the Swiss Re, I mean, it's the central core is still a problem. Uh, and other problems, but they have features which are promising, all of them. And we can actually see the proof, <laughs> it's easy, let's go and see, are the windows open? Oh yeah, okay, so something must be happening. Now how much, for how long, with what impact, we have to look. Are the blinds being used? Are the win uh, windows being open? So the future environmental of top, the future of environmental tall buildings, it's in the potential for natural ventilation. I really believe that. This is where we're gonna go low in energy consumption and we're gonna transform the design. The rules of thumbs are there, but like I said, they are just uh, rules to be creatively tackled by the architects. Um, and then the chapter finishes with a proposal for a design criteria. We talk about, like I said, qualitative and quantitative indicators. And in the qualitative terms, we have several categories. Uh, and the well-being is there, and the ground conditions are there, and energy and environment is still there. It's qualitative as well, how adaptable to future change a building is. Uh, this is all in the book. The quantitative, we have some interesting proposals. For example, when I say the kilowatt hours per square meter, is a very narrow way of looking at it. It's one way, it shouldn't be looked alone. What is the population of the, book, the building? How many and how much are we consuming per person? This is absolutely fundamental. You know, I came across a case study who said we are half of what we predicted to be, or less than half, a third or something. And I went to see and the building is actually half occupied. I said, my friend, like this is easy, you know put people here, put the power, and then tell me if you still are within your, your targets. Of course, after we left, but, uh, so it's not just the energy per square meter, we have to scrutinize, that's the word. Uh, and also this notion that quality has value and can be measured. Where is the daylight until when? Where is the depth of this building? Why the square meter value is the same, closer to the window and closer to the core? new ways of looking at it. It's also quantitative and should be quantified. It can be. And I, in that, in that case, in the category of environmental performance, after revising the principles and looking at the cases, said, okay, we're gonna propose hours of natural ventilation. 
per hours of outdoors thermal comfort, which means if the climate allows you to do it, how much are you doing it? And don't tell me pollution and noise is a, is a barrier. Physics have solved that. It's not a problem. It's, of course, it imposes a challenge, but it can be designed, it can be dealt with design. It's easier to shut, that's for sure, but you can deal with it. And you can do partially. And you're talking about a tall building, 20 meters after the ground level. Urban and noise, is, uh, pollution and noise is not the same anymore. A little bit of principles will tell you that. So this is all explained there. And the ultimate measure is CO2 emissions. I mean, energy is a parameter to compare, is a benchmark which should be locally, locally used, not globally. The way you measure energy and what it means in different contexts, it simply doesn't allow an international cross comparison. We, when we talk about CO2, that's a completely different story. And of course, if we look at a country like Brazil, where the energy matrix is very clean, the CO2 will be low, but the building will still may be or could be energy inefficient. That's why locally we need to look at energy, but globally the interest is in the CO2. These two are the key ways to move forward with its subtleties within each of the categories. And this, this is just an exercise we did, the passive zone when we talk about grade one and the idea of daylight, how much really good daylight conditions some of these icons have. Um, and here we have the, the Commerce Bank on the left hand side, the Swiss Re in the middle, which is the 30th St. Mary X, X Swiss Re, and uh, Heron Tower, which has just been finished, which I, I'm really putting a lot of belief in this building, because I think the, the the architectural concept is so simple, so straightforward, so basic, and so correct that if, if the, the build was built accordingly and if the occupants use that the way it should be using it, I think it's going to be another successful one. Uh, it's the only case I know who was designed with mechanical ventilation all the time, designed to be a sealed tower, just like the UK is, you know, between America and Europe. It's not the natural ventilated German tall building, and it's not the sealed tower. It's in between. That's where UK like to be. Uh, but it's a building that during design, it was conceived like that. And as it gets through development and construction, now the windows can be open. It's the only case. Usually we have the opposite. We have windows, the project where the windows can open, let's see how much we can do natural ventilation, and as it develops, we all know the story, let's close it easier, cheaper, put the conventional air condition inside. This building has been the opposite. So I'm really looking forward for that. Chapter four, we look into the buildings then. So we look at the city, we had a global perspective, we look at design, environmental rules, rules of thumb, what is comfort, how can we change it? Just uh, undoing the myth that the tall building cannot be a more environmentally responsive typology. And then we go into the buildings. And here, I, I look at quite a lot of number of them qualitatively, and then in more in depth, just a few. These are the buildings, and I'm gonna concentrate on the, on the Commerce Bank because there are some new facts on the POE, which is interesting to see. American buildings, and Sao Paulo buildings and Rio, and then two Asian cases. And that's why I said I risk a qualitative assessment. Uh, that's why I said maybe not everybody was very happy with me. And I wasn't sure until the very end if I should put this table or not. And then talking to Nick Baker, who is one of the endorsers of the book, he said, oh, forget that, just do it for you. Nobody's gonna read it, just think like that as if nobody's <laughs> gonna read it. Do what you really think after everything you know. <laughs> and then of course, take a little plane somewhere, disappear. But I just did it. And well, it's, it's, it was difficult to do, uh, but it's like, again, it's, it's factually based and it's theoretically based. So I think there is a, a point there. I'm not gonna go into detail, but something identified in all these buildings it's very basic. We still have a problem in m most of the cases. 
which is with the deep plan. I mean, the commercial values are there. Nothing's gonna change unless we change that. Um, natural ventilation is coming and it's definitely gonna be a differentiator for the design. We can see attempts and uh, the Heron Tower, like I said, is, is a unique example of how this is doing and what is happening around the Commerce Bank as well, how this is coming. <coughs> so looking at the occupied case study, five minutes, um, the Commerce Bank has been occupied since 1998, like I said, and its success comes from a combination of two things. One is it's a very robust design. You know, the SED students know what we mean by robust. It's something that can sustain change, modifications, and surprisingly even perform better. And this is in the basic rules. The rules are there, orientation, form, floor to ceiling height, potential for natural ventilation, shading. It's the basic rules of thumb. Uh, but the, the major parameter is not, well of course the design is very robust, it wouldn't happen without it, but without the approach taken by the facility manager and the occupants who are completely revolutionary, we wouldn't get to what we got here. I mean to the point that to give you an example, the building has or was meant and it started with nine weather stations, one in each garden, measuring very precise what is happening in the villages so we can open and close the windows when the temperature hits a certain set point and this and that. Then after two, three years, he said, oh, this is too complicated. Nobody uses like that. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the building with the BMS system and I really, if the occupants can decide more, based on complaints, he said, if the occupants can decide more, I think we can be better. So remove all these weather stations, put one in the roof so we know what is happening, and let them decide when they want to open their windows. And we just say it is openable. And of course, the weather station at the top, it will say to the occupant, now you have to close your windows. You do it or we're not gonna have, you're not gonna have a natural ventilation. You have to close, you have to close it and we're gonna switch on the system. Now, now is good. If you want to open, you can. If you want to wait a bit, you can. Leaving it more manually, uh, it actually overruled the BMS and the temperatures that were controlled with the BMS when you used to say, now it's 26, you have to close and we, we're gonna air condition your space or, or mechanically ventilate your space. You decide and it's gonna, and then they found records like 26, 26.5, 27, 28. The windows are open, ventilation is working. 28 degrees and people are happy just because they are used to the natural ventilation and they like the natural ventilation. So the building was actually made simpler through facility, facilities to the management. This, its occupation has increased and the cellular plan became more of an open plan. So what we see, the plan was initially divided in zones where they would have different controls. Zone one and two became one because the building got more people. We need uh, to put more employees in here. We can't afford the cellular office. Let's do a half open plan because we need space. So they have uh, almost 700 people more in the whole tower and the consumption has been reduced. But how can, how can this be with, with the climatization? Natural ventilation is still efficient. What does it mean? The depth, the facade, the orientation, even with the internal loads that were increased, it is giving you what we need for comfort. Uh, so it went through a simplification of the monitoring, the controls, it went to a higher density and change of the internal layout and it's still performing good. So this is really, it's putting a lot of um, responsibility to the occupants knowing that the building can sustain these change and experimenting. So here we have some figures and if we look, this is only This is electrical energy, and we see that the building, including all the electrical, it's not just uh, 
what is spent with climatization and if any system that it's needed. But power, all the electrical, and we see the building consumes less than the, the German standard. It's not any standard, it's the German energy standard. Uh, for mechanically ventilated and heated buildings, and of course, much better than the air-conditioned buildings. If you reduce the energy which is needed for appliances and equipment, it's probably going to be very little for climatization. So it's a really incredible achievement. And if when we look just at cooling and heating, the building consumes less than the German standard for naturally ventilated and heated buildings. I have here the two engineers who work in the project, John Perry and Klaus Bode, when they were in Roger Preston. And we did a technical visit together. I wanted to see the gardens. They wanted to see the chillers. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, of course, everybody was happy with this result. And, and it is definitely a team effort. 10 years of monitoring and occupation. This with including the, the key role of the occupants. Lessons learned and the future issues for the environmental tall building. Like Klaus highlighted in the beginning, we go back to the forward. And well, environmental impact is, is, is a key concern for institutions like the UNEP. I've just been working with some other group in a chapter called Green Buildings for the new Green Economy Report. Um, and we are looking for indicators, we are looking for good case studies, and we are looking how to measure, how to promote incentives and also penalties for this new generation, existing and new generation of buildings, especially these monsters who consume lots of energy. So the future is very challenging. Um, iconic buildings have a key role. They shouldn't become models. You know, the Commerce Bank, this is something I heard in New York, which was great. One of the offices when I went there, he said, well, first thing I have to tell you before you give me any questions, I mean, you're not going to see a Commerce Bank here, okay? The Commerce Bank is a German building. I said, well, what makes it a German building? And of course they knew the daylight, the area of facade for daylight, the views. It's, it's, it is a German building. But it is an iconic building, doesn't need to be reproduced, but set the targets and tell us how low we can be. We don't need to be like that, we don't need to copy the form, we don't need to be like the Swiss Re, but we have to look at these figures and we have to be always better. Because very few, uh, like just remember the IPCC target, are hitting the target. Environmental conditions will be less homogeneous, less controlled, both functionally and environmentally. So there's a lot of room for the architecture. It's not a technical challenge. We have the technology, just reinforce that. The best cases come from innovative design. And the engineers of these buildings who are giving some results are creative engineers. They are designing the towers, you can ask them. I mean, they are designing the towers and the architects are thinking about the environment and the systems. That's the only way we're going to get through. Um, and then the book closes with a design exercise with students from Sao Paulo and students from Nottingham looking at um, briefs, almost dreams for tall buildings in London and in Sao Paulo. And it's quite interesting what we come across using the simple tools showing that it's, of course, it's a complex design to be developed, but as, again, with creativity and innovation, we have the technology, we can come up with an uh, unusual and totally new solutions. Oops, sorry. It's not the end. <laughs> well, now it became. Um, thanks very much for your attention, and I hope it shows a promising um, it, it, the idea also is to say, look, I mean, there's a lot we can do. Like I said, it is a positive message, not about the tall building, but about environmental design and, and how much there's still to be done in the architectural realm from our sides. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? No?
Just wait a little bit, because you're going to get the microphone. OK. Um, you started the talk uh, by not defining a tall building. Uh, and then in the end, you started talking about average performance. Yeah. So I'm just like a, a rough indication. If you look at a, a given city, um, how do you do that averaging? Like how when you talk about a tall building performing above or below average, you mm -hmm. still have some sense of um, um, uh, tallness, right? So I'm just wondering. Um, yeah. What is actually, I mean, if you look at, we looked at a very specific examples, but what are the worst performances and how many more are there of those than, you know, the Commerce Bank? You, you talk the worst performance in terms of energy, yeah? We are talking about energy. But you're yeah. asking about heights of building as well. If heights is related to energy, is that your question? No, m my question is... Um, Mm, how m so if we look at the lower end of the spectrum it, when in terms of performance, mm -hmm. any indication that what you would prefer, but like how many m more are they? You know, wh where is the sort of the median compared to the average? Well, the performance and, and when I look at the global perspective and I look at the case studies, I put what we have, what we found out against what is uh, a reference from that location. Yeah? So when we talk about Sao Paulo, it's one thing. We talk about London, it's a, it's a different thing. When we talk about Frankfurt, it's, a, it's a, another figure. But I can tell you, just thinking of the principles, that the most energy consuming buildings are where we have the harsh climate. So this starts le leads you to Asia. Um, and with the model from the temperate climate. So it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to end up with high consumption. Um, glass towers in the desert, complicated. Um, and of course, we can make estimations and you can improve this performance. But there's also a limit that you can improve this performance, yeah, with the shape and with the glass and even with the shading. The question then becomes why here? almost. And if so, how do you cover that performance? Yeah. So there is a limit you can do with the design and the remaining loads, how do you deal with? Maybe we don't do the conventional energy system. Maybe we would have alternative clean energy um, systems to supply that demand. But if you're looking for figures, it's very specific. So I would invite you to look into the book, really. We see the, the, the benchmarks from the German scenario. The, I can tell you in London, that a good performance office building, which includes these towers, are around, according to SIBSI, 250 kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, and the, the good buildings say, in prediction, that they are 30% better than this with predicting a little bit of natural ventilation. And some of these good buildings actually, in the end of the day, don't open their windows. So they are not even achieving this 30%. In terms of height, if we go to a city like Sao Paulo, which is, uh, features in the book a lot, you know, the, build, the, the residential buildings are all 25 stories, 22 stories. A commercial building could get to 30 stories, maybe even more. It's definitely the lowest. America has taller buildings, 40, 50. London, it's very much in parallel with what is happening in terms of height now with what we see in New York. And then you have the Asian buildings, which are by far the tallest. And it's a pure, it's a pure economic and not even economic, it's, it's a political statement. You know, just look at Petronas and other buildings. To make money with these guys, you don't need to build that high. You actually s stop making money but you still want to make the statement. So even the economic value um, is undermined when we're talking about very tall buildings, if, if this was part of your question. Okay. Yeah? Guido? Uh, <coughs> you said a few times that uh, a big problem in tall building is uh, the core of the building. 
and the central area of it. And is that because uh, it's a difficult area to, where it's difficult to achieve uh, um <coughs> passive design or why? What I is mean, the, yeah, I was not specific. Well, I mean, if you could briefly like explain mm. this. Um, the problem with the central, the central core is that you either have a very narrow plan close to the central core and then the cellular offices or the open plan will be single-sided ventilation but still work. But that's all you can do. It's basically, it's, it's, it's a relation with the net ventilation strategy. Once you have the central core, you have to be single-sided ventilation. Y and you are limited to that. Once your cores are on the side or outside, you have much more flexibility on how to do it. Uh, and of course, it impacts the depth of the building as well, which means the central core gives you a good structure support to be deep. And if it's deep, you are away from the window. That's why you do central core. And if it's away from the window, you're going to get less ventilation, even if you open, and definitely less daylight. So it's a, it's a, it's a limiting factor. But when we look actually how the Swiss re solved the problem in principle, it's a quite clever design because you, you are not so deep and you cut inside, increase the facade. I have some points about how the, the facade was designed, which um, I'm not so sure how it's really working. But there are ways also of dealing with the central core. But in principle, is a limitation for, for the ventilation strategy. But again, you can always prove by design that it's working. Like I said, this is a rule of thumb that is just a rule of thumb. The design creatively can deal with that and still be economically. Just an interesting economic indicator. This, these iconic buildings, their usable area, uh, sometimes even lower, usable in the conventional way, lower than 50% of the total floor area. Whereas the market would ask for something like 80 or 85 usable area. I can tell the Commerce Bank you quantify, even you take a plan of these buildings in any journal, do a rough calculation, you will see 60%, 70%. So where is the value there? It's in the views, it's in the garden, it's in the atrium. People meet, work there, like to go there. So when I talk about change of values associated with the design, it's also seeing how do you see what is a usable area. But this is outside your question, Guido, but thanks. Yeah, also. A comment. Thank you. No, two questions. <laughs> um, first question uh, has to do, sorry. Uh, first question has to do with uh, what you were just talking about. Um, when you design a tall building, usually what you do is that you have the building pad and uh, you replicate that building pad a certain number, uh, say 40, 60, and that gives you the deep plans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, what, what is more desirable is to have a, a shallow plan. Um, and mm. it, that, that would allow for cross ventilation and for, for daylight. However, when, you, uh, when a developer goes to a bank, uh, they want to um, improve the, the, the area, the meterage area. Uh, if, we, if we have uh, shallower plans, that means that the building is gonna be taller, is it not? Shallow plans, no, it's the opposite. The deeper plan gives you a base for the height. Yes. The shallow plan, you are limited in height. But this is a design trick because you can have a combination of shallow plans, attach it by cores, and go as high as if you had a central core. But if I'm um, required to do, for example, a 200,000 square meter building, uh, it, yeah, uh, then if I go with shallow plans, that means that the, the height will be taller, no? Oh, I, I understand what you mean. You yep. need more floors to cover the area yes. you need. Well, 2,000 square meters is something. No, I'm just giving you a number. talking about <laughs> the double of the Commerce Bank. Or yeah, the yeah. but I'm just giving you a number. Uh, say 100,000. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, um, 
uh, that has to do more with how we, uh, how even how we charge, we architects or engineers, mm -hmm. how we charge uh, our clients and how those clients charge the bank or get their loans from the bank. Yeah. And also the interpretation of the area, Alfonso. You know, what is usable area? Where this 100,000 square meters will be? To what? This is a design brief. You, architect, come up with intelligent environmental solution. I see. Um, yeah, sorry, I drifted away from uh, the other one. Uh, the other one was that um, uh, you give examples, uh, as example, New York, uh, as an American city. And um, I was wondering if there, there were any thoughts about uh, the zoning of the city itself. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, New York is a very integrated area. You can work uh, close to where you live, as opposed to, for example, Houston, that uh, have the residential areas 50 or tw uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 15 or 20 miles away from, from when you, you work. And that amounts also for, for the um, the amount of carbon that you emit every year, yeah. just getting to work. It's very interesting what you're saying. It, there is something about this in the first chapter uh, from my visit from New York and with planners and architects. The text is, is not identify who said what. It's a collection of ideas and interpretation of them. But what we say is um, <laughs> it's actually the island. It's a very efficient urban territory with very inefficient buildings. And in the end of the day, if we want to reduce energy consumption in cities, if instead of only talking about CO2 emissions from buildings, but from cities, I, I don't want to make anybody disappointed, but the issue is in the transportation, is in the cities. Um, and New York, in that case, has a, a very good example, and we proved that. But again, like I said, it's not only about density, it's about zoning and functions, as you say, and diversity, if you want to bring life and economic value for that, to that. Uh, so yes, there are some reflections on that when we talk about tall buildings and the city. There should be. We have to look at into this context. So we know the weight of what we are actually doing and we should be doing. And there's this classical graph that I didn't, didn't want to make it technical that shows density and energy consumption per capita. It's a classical thing from eight, 1980s that puts New York and London and Australian cities and talks about that. But yes, the key is in the zoning, if we want to be serious about pollution coming from cities. That's why now, if you ask me, what you didn't ask me, where do I move from here? It's <laughs> taller cities. You know, it's uh, taller cities or denser environments with taller buildings. Not tall buildings, but taller buildings. How does this work in a group? I think this is a natural unfolding of this research. Uh, hi. Hi, Francisco. Yeah. Uh, now I want to, to go back to the introduction uh, with, uh, with Le Corbusier, mm. because uh, it's not, it's, I think it's not a question, it's like a, a, a single comment. Yeah. Because uh, we know all the, uh, his famous image of the one million habitants uh, city, no? About he, how he draw this uh, new city with, with tall buildings. But when we see his architecture, he's never uh, built a, a very high rise building. Even though he was very sensitive in his way of, of the climate and the weather and yeah. the environment. Yeah. And it's kind of a contradiction between what he uh, think or thought about the city. I think what he thought about more like the misunderstanding of what a modern city is going to be, yeah. more uh, than what really he uh, understands of our high-rise building, because when he built 
he doesn't build like, you know, like that. Yet. He was very concise of the weather, of the climate and the environmental, mm -hmm. even in Rio, Delhi, yeah. France or whatever. So it's, 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 it's curious to, to, to see those uh, mm -hmm. contradictions in Le Corbusier in, in how he imagined the city like that, but even in his tectonics and building his I think it's a contradiction that we have today still. I don't think it's only a Le Corbusier. It's some, not something that stays in history. Yeah. Uh -huh. One more, and I think we have to go, because yeah? everybody's invited for the drinks and the book. Yeah, I think we have two very quick questions, and I can answer when we go down. Shashan, you want to make I a point? Uh, we know that, let's say, in 13 years, there hasn't been a tall building like Chromosom Bank. Yeah. But we see more examples of, let's say, not so tall buildings cropping up, which are mm. claiming to be sustainable. Uh, what do you think is the reason? I mean, the architects are not designing well, the engineers are like not optimizing well, the users are like not using it well. You mean why that new iconic buildings are not as tall or not? No, I mean like we have, we don't have example like Commerce and Bank, like that's still now, but we have examples of not so tall buildings which are sustainable. So I mean, where? Why we don't have more tall buildings with better performance? Yeah. Um, there's buildings that are succe that succeeded or are succeeding. It's a combination. is is the design with the s the city involvement, the culture, architectural culture of the place, the environmental culture of the place. And in the case when we have a successful case like the Commerce Bank uh, or the GSW Tower also in Berlin, is when all these factors come together and they don't come together in any commercial or in many commercial developments. I'm, 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 that's why, you know, it's not blaming the architect or blaming the climate. You need a combination of, um, yeah, so it will or wills for this to happen. And it's quite a challenge, even when everybody wants. <laughs> Those who do, they know. Very brief, and then we go, yeah? You wanted to say? Not only did it have um, improved energy performance in terms of lighting and natural ventilation, but um, uh, efficiency of the workers and productivity increased, as well as um, absence. Um, there was a decrease in absence rates as well. I was wondering if you'd um, maybe be able to take that a bit further. When we talk about quality, we talk about that. The references are the same. Um, there's, funny enough, very little research made on seriously on the impact of environmental quality and productivity, although we all, almost as a common sense, we know that's a fact. Um, so when we talk about daylight and ventilation, as it's interesting what you're saying, my concern with quality and this kind of impact on the occupants um, started when I compared a European case, which was quite good, let's talk about the Commerce Bank, and a Sao Paulo building that energy-wise and CO2-wise was doing well. But when we look at what you have inside as a space, I mean you can say they mark the same. They are different spaces, they have different qualities, they motivate people differently. So from that point you say, okay, we can't just talk about a simple benchmark or energy figure and we have to talk about quality. Absolutely, you know, it is there. Well, I would like to thank everybody for sustaining so long. And let's have some drinks downstairs. Thanks. <laughs>